My name is Aileen McDonough, and I own a company called 3AM Writers in Rhode Island. Um, I used to work up in Boston, so it's great to be here again. Um, thank you so much, Tom and Reiko, for um, having me here tonight. Um, so what I'm here to talk about tonight is creating great content and how to blog like a boss. Um, we're going to find out what it means to blog like a boss and how you can be doing it yourself, um, even if you're not a seasoned copywriter like myself. Um, I know that a lot of people here, um, how many people here are developers? Okay, how many people are designers or de designers and developers? <coughs> Any word people here at all? <laughs> Shout out. How are you? Um, great. So we're going to be talking about content. So I know that all of you developers and designers are all about the user experience. And you're all about creating beautiful, beautiful sites. And then you go to a client and you say, okay, here's your beautiful, beautiful site. And they say to you, but where are all the words? And you go, well, that was what you were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, or you call somebody like me and I give you the words. But when it comes down to blogging, um, if you're trying to blog for yourself and you're trying to blog for your business, you know, very often you may not have the budget to hire a copywriter, or you may be wanting to do um, the blogging yourself because you wanted to have your own personal touch. So we're going to go through some very easy blog ideas and some easy guidelines to writing your own blog, making it efficient, and making it fun for yourself so that you can do your own blogging. So, how's that sound? Okay. So, who am I to talk about content? As I said, I'm Chief, Chief Executive and Writer for 3AM Writers. The reason that my company is called 3AM Writers is because I started it 10 years ago. I had a toddler, a baby, and a dog, and it was the only time that it was quiet in my house. So that's why my company name is 3AM Writers. Um, I blog for several companies, um, mostly ghostwriting, but I also get to put my name on a few things here and there, which is always fun. For instance, I blog for, um, I blog as Honda Mama for Herb Chambers Honda of Seacock. Um, so I get to sort of sort of be half myself and half the sort of character for um, for that particular company. So I'm fairly used to blogging not only for my own interest but for companies. So who are you? What I often say is that your website is about what you do and your blog is about who you are. So give me somebody just shout out an industry that they work in, even if it's Everything that I get to, to research in. So, so when we're when you're putting out your website, that's all about what you do, you know, the services you provide and what you're doing for people. But your blog is really your way to start to connect with your customers and to, to let them know that you are actually a person behind all this. We've undergone an interesting switch. You know, in the past, you know, companies were companies and people were people. I'm not trying to make a political statement, but what I am saying here is that you know. Now you're going to hear people talk more about your personal brand. And they're starting to market themselves like a company. On the other side of it, if you're a company, you need to start thinking like a person. You need to show people the caring behind the company. You need to show people that there are actual people behind your company. Because otherwise, they're not really going to feel like doing business with you. So it's important to make sure that your blog starts to have a more friendly feeling about it. But the biggest thing is that you need to be the boss of your blog. Ooh, that's fun. You need to make sure that your blog knows who's boss, because otherwise it will start, soon start to run your life. And that's the situation that I get with a lot of companies. Gotta love acronyms. When you're blogging like a boss, the reality is that the boss doesn't have a whole lot of time. So we need to make sure that we're blogging with purpose, efficiency, promotability, and we'll have an extra P, personality. This is what I always say at the beginning. People go, but I just don't know how to write a blog. I don't even know how to get started. That's what we're going to talk about. Is everybody ready to learn? Yes. <laughs> okay. So we're going to get right into it and talk about the anatomy of an effective blog post. Now, to some of you, this is going to be like ABC123. But you wouldn't believe how many people I talk to that this they've never even thought of this before. 
the first thing that you're going to make sure that you're writing is a good title. Because no one's going to want to read it if it doesn't have a good title. So you have to make sure that you use your keyword in your post title. You have to test titles to see what gets shared. And what I always try to think is, how will people search for this info? It's amazing to me how many times I see a title that's just a little weird and esoteric and strange. And I'm going, you know what? You have to think, how are people going to search for your info? So if you've got a certain industry in mind, tell me, way, tell me something that your people, people tend to search for in your industry. Funding. Funding. So how do I get funding? How does my nonprofit get funding? How does my startup get funding? How do I get some funding for my startup? All those are now your titles. The minute you go onto Google and just start searching, how do I, that is a title. So you have to think, how will people search for this info? And that will bring you the titles that you need to be putting out there. Don't get too cute. I mean, you can get a little cute, but I always say the first title should be very easy. In your intro, you're going to talk about why are we here. You want people to know right away because people read very slowly on the web. People read 20% slower on the web than they do on paper. So you need to make sure that you get right away with them and say, here's why we're here. Find a hook. Get them interested. Ask a question. I am a big fan of questions because people will answer them in their brain. It's just like when you see a meme of Morgan Freeman and people start to talk, talk in, you know, oh, you just read that in Morgan Freeman's voice. It's, it's half, like if you ask a question, people will answer in their heads and now you've got them. Draw the reader in. And for SEO purposes, make sure you're using your keyword in your first paragraph. It amazes me, even as long as I've been doing this, how many times I will put in an intro and go, ooh, I didn't use my keyword, now I gotta work it in. So just think for yourself, you know, think for yourself when you're writing your intro, put the keyword into the first paragraph. Okay. Then you get into the body of the blog. What are we telling people? What do we want them to know? What information are you trying to get across? And this is where you get into the meat of things. This is where you want to get your list in. This is where you want to make sure that you have scannable paragraphs. Is anybody struggling with how to set up a blog? I mean, you guys all, most of you are developers, so you're familiar with how they should sort of look when they roll up on the screen? Okay. The basics are really that you want to make sure that you have headings or subheadings. You've got your H1s, your N1s, but we'll develop speak for you. Um, you want to make sure that you have some good transition words in there when you're writing. However, and, but, yes, it's okay to start a sentence with and or but. We can, we can bend that during a roll. Um, you also want to make sure that you're using short paragraphs. This is very key because what happens is people just scan. They don't want to look at a, you know, a giant blob of text. Think about when you get that email from somebody and it's just this giant sort of blob of text trying to sort of slog through it. You don't want people to do that. You want them to be able to scan your, your blog very, very easily. Now, Effective Blog also has purpose. There's a reason why you're here. A blog is not dear diary. How many people have made the mistake of putting something up and then going, Ooh, yeah, that was a little too much information. We've all been there. Okay. You need to remember, that especially on a company blog or a blog that you're writing for your own particular company, you are there for a purpose. The purpose is probably to sell some stuff. So you want to make sure that your closing circles back to the intro, you have some call to actions, and you have some actionable steps. Now, the difference in my mind between an actionable step and a call to action, call to action is what you want your readers to do. So that's, you know, check out our website, or look at our services, or call for a consultation. Actionable steps might be some other steps that would be of value to the readers. So that might be circling back to the intro. If you were giving, for instance, an informational blog, you're going to want to tell them, you know, if you were just telling them how to write a blog, you're going to give them some steps to get started. So that's a different <coughs> if you're doing a blog for a company, for instance, a sponsored blog, I also like putting in what I call a little shark tail, and it's just a little blurb that talks about your purpose. So it's this blog is sponsored by whoever it's sponsored by, click comment or share, just asking people to relate and engage with your blog. 
and letting them know where it's coming from. Because of course, you know, if you're writing an off-site blog, then you want to make sure that people understand what the connection is. Um, most companies now have the blog attached to their website, but some of them still have things that are sort of like an offshoot. Um, it's a good way to do things if you want, sort of like, if you want to be a little bit standalone and to, to feel like you're not quite part of the company, but you are still sponsored. So to establish a connection, we do a little short tail. So putting that purpose back front and center. <laughs> It's just before the subscribe, unsubscribe. Um, I actually usually will put it at the bottom of each um, post. Like that's something I'll put. Because sometimes people don't read the entire blog. They'll just read one post. So you can put that in as the post. I sometimes will have something like this by the post, but shorter than that. And by the subscribe, unsubscribe. And this I might have like towards the bottom of, the, of each article. That so way it's so much easier. put the highlights of a blog post in an email blast. Yes, we do, we do that as well, and one thing, and I'll talk about this later, but one thing we use for that is MailChimp, because it'll just, it sends it right out, so that makes it nice and easy. It's got a really good integration with WordPress. So. Okay. So, we've already talked about purpose. Purpose of your blog, selling, educating, informing your customers. But, you're the boss. You don't have a lot of time. So you need to think efficiency. You need to think efficiently. You need to always be thinking, what's the most efficient way to do things? And one of the ways you need to think efficiently is ideas. We always say, okay, there's the same ideas that are coming across all the time. You know, Christmas comes once a year, but it always comes on December 25th. Not much changes about that. But there's always a way to unpack the ideas you have and make them bigger. So if you want to be effective, effective for your blogging, you need to think, okay, what would be the most efficient way to use these ideas? Your best content strategy is to make each post work. You don't let them be lazy. You don't want to just do one thing. You want to always be expanding. So when you post one article, you need to be thinking, okay, what's next for this idea? How can we expand on this idea? How do we capitalize on current buzz? If there's something going on, you want to post about it. Can we pre pre present a fresh angle on this idea? I always think of this. I heard a story. Um, Taylor Swift. Not that I'm a Taylor Swift fan, but I'm just going to put that out there. Taylor Swift talks about um, her mother, um, who her, I guess her family calls her mother worst case scenario Andrea, right? So this is, her mother finds the worst case scenario of whatever is going on. So Taylor Swift was having this interview, and she was talking about how one day her mother was telling her she needed to stop lighting candles. Now, why do usually people tell you to stop lighting candles or, or stop using candles? Because you're going to create a fire. You're going to light the house on fire, right? Exactly. That's why I'm limited to one candle. I'm too distracted. I'm, one can I'm a one candle person. That's it. I can only handle one. So anyway, her mother was saying, you need to stop lighting candles. And she said, well, why, Mom? Obviously, I'm not going to burn the house down. I always make sure I blow it up before I leave the house. And she said, no. They're finding that people are getting lung cancer from too many candles. So, that was a fresh angle. You never know what angle's out there. You need to think, okay, where can we go beyond this? There's a lot of old stories out there. Can we get a fresh angle and bring it to this particular story? And then you want to think, where does this idea go? Because, you know, when you're writing copy and you're a boss, and you have other things to do, you have plenty of things on your list, you need to be thinking, okay, I'm writing this blog, but where else is it going to go? Is it going to go on Facebook? How do I need to tweak it to go there? Is it going to go on Twitter? How do I need to make it go there? Can I use this for brochures? Can I use this for a letter? Anytime you write something, you want to be thinking, what else can I be doing with this? And I personally am the queen of you give me one idea, and I will make three articles about it. It's, it's just kind of a way of thinking where you start to look at things and think, OK, how can I expand on this? For instance, uh, giving industry, talk about healthcare, any other? Coal mining. Coal mining. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we're going to get political. <laughs> well, you might start with a profile of a. You might start with a profile of a locally renowned coal miner, right? But when you go beyond that, there's a lot more digging that can be done. Thank you for the pun. And <laughs> you can expand into how coal mining affects the environment. How coal mining can, you know, how loss of coal mining has affected the industry and 
West Virginia, you can expand. So when you're thinking, for instance, you know, I, I do a lot of profiles. I love profiles because I love people's stories. But what I love beyond just getting into people's stories is that beyond the story, there's always another article in there somewhere. If I'm talking to an accountant, I want to know all their secrets. I want to fix accounting. It's such a sexy topic. Um, but I always try to get to, okay, what are the secrets? What do I need to know? And then suddenly they'll tell me something about the IRS that I never do, and now we have another article. So when you're thinking and searching for your articles, even in your own industry, you know all the secrets. So you can pull these secrets out of the story and, and make more articles with them. Don't feel like one article. Don't allow yourself any lazy blog posts. Make them work. Does anyone have any questions so far? No questions. Excuse Yes. I'm just curious. I readability right, right at this very moment in time, as Yoast has told us, is 300 words. So that is, that's really like, don't try not to do anything under 300 words. On the other hand, if you're thinking in terms of SEO and you want to really expand your blog, you want to look for 300 words, 500-ish words, and 1,500 words. So you want to have a good mix of content that has like your short form content, 300 and over, and then your long form content that's going to say 1,500 words. So that's what you kind of want to go for, a good mix. But try not to put anything out. It's always like you're, you're putting it in there, and I have, um, if you have Yoast, it'll tell you like exactly how many words, and then like the minute you get to that 300, it's green. <laughs> it's so exciting. And I might get 299 trying to find a place to put in the. <laughs> but, you know, when you... When you do that, and the reason that they do that, I know that we would like to think that Google is just out to, you know, or, or whatever, is out to just you know, make our lives more difficult. But the reality is that you can't really attack a subject in under 300 words, so they want good quality content. So there is a, there is a reason behind it. I like to believe maybe there is. Maybe it's all just random, but I like to believe. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing page content, would you use that same principle of 300 words on a page, like an about me page or a product page? I wouldn't. Use example. This is chiefly for blogging. I would really be, I would really be, it, that is totally determined by like the subject matter and the company and industry. That's a whole other, a couple other thing. Because your about me might be different from someone else's. I've done about me's for um, companies where it's just mission, vision. And then I've done about me's where there it's mission, vision, and bios, and, and, and suddenly it's, you know, 3,000 words. But that's okay, because that's okay for That's a really good question. But what happens is it totally depends on your readers. So what I always say is at first when you launch your blog, you should pick a day and a time and religiously put it out there every single, like that day and time. And do that for six months. And then you can start to play with it and see when your readers are reading it. And then go by what your readers are reading and when they're reading it. And you can find out in Google Analytics. So that's, you know, that, but you'll start to see, oh, everyone's reading on a Saturday. I wish there was like a great answer for that. And I've read so many articles on it that say, well, Monday's a great day. Well, Thursday's a great day. Again, very dependent on your reader, your industry, you know, what, what your readers are doing. I say always go back to what your particular readers are doing. <laughs> what do you think about these blog titles that are always like, um, one thing you need to know, or the seven best, you know, they're always giving some hint about a list and how it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> you read it and you think, okay, this is going to be short form. I'm going to be able to get what I need out of it quickly. Is that a strategy that you like or dislike? Much as those could be kind of boring titles, they do work. I mean, really. But it doesn't have to be 10 all the time. It can just, it can be kind of whatever number you want. But people do tend to, those, those blogs do tend to rise on the rankings. So I think as a strategy, it works to do something like that. And it's good because it does lend itself more to a short blog that people are going to get exactly what they need. Unless, of course, you get on BuzzFeed on your mobile phone and it's like click and go through and like you just then you're throwing across the room. Um, but yeah, I think I think lists listicles are fine. I mean I think especially if you're looking to educate your readers, it's a nice short, quick way to do that. And then what do you think about putting it making the blog 
long title of question. I think that's fine. Absolutely. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that. And then people are wanting to answer it. So, yeah. How do you, how to blogs get unbelievable, unbelievable um, play? Mm -hmm. We're going to have another QA after, just so you know. But I just wanted to see if anyone. So these are 10 easy blog ideas. I'm very big on um, letting people lead with a lot of different things that can get you started. Um, so we're going to go through each of these. I can show you some examples and just um, just kind of describe what, they, what they're about. Uh, case studies, excellent for developers. In fact, I'm doing some case studies for a developer right now in Boston. Um, it's, great, it's great for those type of industries that are hard to explain and hard to sell when you have a really esoteric industry and you're trying to understand how to describe it to people. A case study is a great way to do it. Think about it. If you've ever read a self-help book, you're kind of like, yeah, 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 and then it goes to a case study about some crazy person who's way crazier than you are, and you are all about that. <laughs> so case studies get a lot of play. And that's also a time where you can really get your long-form content out there. You can do a lot more with a case study. You can, you can expand on it a lot. So case study is a great way to do, um, it's a great blog idea. Now we're really going to test out the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Featured product. Now this is the kind of thing that can feel really boring. I know. But if you have a lot of different products, then a featured product blog is a great thing for you. This happens to me my husband, sometimes he listens to me and does what I tell him to do, which is nice. Um, and they started to get a whole bunch of different products and they really didn't know how to get the word out. So they started doing a plug, feature product. <coughs> Another way to get a lot of really great long form content on there because you can write a lot about a product. You can put in specs, you can put in images, you can, you can put in brand names and that can be very, very good for your SEO. And this is a blog too that will reap a lot of different articles. So you start with a featured product, then you're talking about how to use it. Then you're talking about what the products work with it. It reaps a lot of rewards. Mm -hmm. I'll see, so now it's going to put me back here. Another great thing to do is featured client, featured staff member. Again, people love stories. <coughs> Staff members, they really want to learn about your staff members. I know it sounds crazy, but they really do. And then your staff members feel excited because then they feel like they're part of the company and you're touting them. Same with clients. If you have great clients that you love to work with, feature them. As long as it's not going to hurt your business, you could feature them through a featured client um, blog article or you could do a case study. Um, another great thing, again, for efficiency's sake, is series. We did a series with an accounting firm that I do work with a while ago. We were talking about you know, the idea of people wanting to do more with their businesses but not really knowing you know, who to go to. So we talked about the idea of assembling a financial team. Boom, soon we had 12 blog articles lined up. We went from how to choose your financial team to why you need one to you know, profiling every person on that team. There's probably a similar thing in any of your... Um, you know, in any of your industries, healthcare, assembling your healthcare team, assembling your research team. So that could be something that you could expand on for your own. Okay. Comparison. As we know from the recent political madness, people really like to argue. <laughs> Um, so a great blog to do, a great blog article, is a comparison. Pick out different products that are out there. Think about the different, especially this is also really good for SEO, because brand names tend to carry a lot of weight in SEO. So if you work with specific brands, um, throw out some brands that you work with. Come on, throw me something. I see you. Anyone? Hotels. Hotels. So you can be doing a comparison between large hotels and small hotels, boutique hotels versus, you know, chain hotels. <coughs> then take specific ones. You know, you could, look, you could go into a town and compare all different hotels. There's so many possibilities. So when you do something like that, it's nice because you're actually setting up for engagement because everyone is going to have an opinion. I mean, amazingly, too. And ever since I started working in automotive, 
people have amazing opinions on their cars. I mean, they are, they will go to their grave for Honda versus Toyota, and you will not get them off of it. So you can get a lot of engagement off of something like that. Okay. One of my favorite blog articles to do is a roundup. People have probably seen millions of roundups for, you know, WordPress page blog articles. Um, but what we try to do, too, is think about, okay, who, who would we like to work with? Who can we collaborate with? Because there's a lot of power in partnership and collaboration. So when you're first doing your blog, you want to start thinking, okay, who can I reach out to? Who can I feature on my blog? And who could I possibly be a guest blogger for? So when you do something like a roundup, which is basically... Going through and picking anywhere from three to ten um, different resources or um, you know, types of products or things that you use, going through, talking a little bit about them, and then letting them know that you did so, that can be a very powerful way to start building some, um, you know, to start building some partnerships, start building with the people around you, and start thinking to yourself, hmm, who do I work with? Like if you're in the food industry, you know, who are you working with? You know, the the other people that you're partnering with. If you're surrounded by other, like if you're in more sort of the tourist side, if you're surrounded by hotels, maybe round up all your local hotels. Like, look at the different, um, if you're doing food delivery, you know, do a roundup of the greatest Mexican restaurants that you're delivering for. There's all sorts of ways that you can do this. And when you reach out to those people, you know, give them a quick tweet or, you know, put it on Facebook and tag them, then they feel like, oh, okay, they're, they're part of my business too. And they want to start getting your business forward as well. Informational is pretty straightforward. When you want to teach your users anything, you use an informational blog article. You know, you're, just, you're looking to educate. You're looking to put information out there. And just try to make it as interesting as you can. And you would be surprised at how many times people just, they don't know all the secrets of your business. If you can share some, then they'll actually have something to get excited about. We talked a little bit about guest blog. And this was a guest blog that we did um, for my accounting company that I do some work for. They had a partner, an insurance company, and so we did a blog about you know, preparing for a stress-free tax year in as, in as much as you can. And um, we were able to put it up on theirs. And then they put it out on their Facebook. And so it's amazing when you start to do these partnerships, you're really creating the web on your own and creating sort of this, this network that people can go back to. Now, as I said, people love to argue. <laughs> this was a blog that we wrote actually two years ago. And every uh, when it snows, I am so freaking happy because I drag this puppy out and we get a ton of engagement. You would not believe. How many here? How many people here think that when the when it starts to snow, you should put your wipers up, like away from your car? Okay, well I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> we actually had this discussion yes, these are the discussions that make up my life I love it we had this discussion with the service team at Herb Chambers Honda of Seacon and they said we go crazy when we see the windshield wipers up because if the windshield wipers are up there's many reasons that are all detailed in this blog if you would like to read it but the, the end result basically is that the weakest point on your car is that little plastic thing that holds your windshield wiper on so it's the easiest to break, especially when it gets brittle, which is what happens when it gets cold. And if it breaks, then you will break your windshield likely. And instead of repairing a windshield wiper, you will be repairing a windshield, which is a lot more expensive. So we were telling everybody that you should just keep them down during a storm. Yes, you are going to have to clean them off. We live in New England. I know it's hard to accept, but it is a part of it. And was one thing. So we put this up there, and it's so fun because every winter, every time it snows, I just start an argument with everybody I know. But the settle an argument blog can be, if, you know, if you don't let yourself get too sensitive about it, don't get too political, can be a lot of fun. You can get a lot of, you can get a lot of engagement because people love to weigh in. They need, you, then you get all these com then you get all these comments up, down, da 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 da, and your Facebook engagement goes. So 
settle an argument. If there is any argument to be had in your business, look for look for a pro con and see if there's a way to come down on each side. That's always a fun blog to do. We talked a little bit about long form blog articles. Hello. <coughs> Especially in the more um, complicated fields, this is the, something that I wrote um, for New England Journal of Medicine. And so as you get into the more complicated fields, you get to see more of this long form content. They need that for SEO. And sometimes they really need it because they have very complex sub subjects that they're dealing with. So this is a way to, you know, to get it. This is just an example. Obviously, I don't think you're going to call them and write about this. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> it's very specific. And lastly, video. And we're going to talk a little bit about more, more about that, so I'm going to move on with the next slide. Another thing, does anybody write for a bilingual audience? If you're ever wondering what to do and a different way to take your blog, publish in English and Spanish or pick another language that you know that your um, audience is, is reading. Um, make sure your tags are in the correct language. This is a mistake a lot of people make. Um, make sure that all of your tags and categories are actually, not categories, but your tags and your um, titles and little snippets are all in the right language. Um, if you don't happen to speak another language, Transposh, I've heard, is a good um, translating um, as a good translating mechanism. So, we give that a whirl. Okay. 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 The next piece of efficiency is using your editorial calendar. Um, there's actually an editorial calendar that you can download from my blog. We call it our stunningly simple editorial calendar because we like spreadsheets. Sorry, we just do. But there is a WordPress editorial calendar plugin, but you can use that, try it. We've thought about moving over to that. Um, but the simplest thing for me has always just been a spreadsheet with months on the top and you know subjects on the bot on the side and just kind of go forward and then plan it out. When you plan things, you feel more comfortable in being spontaneous. It's weirdly ironic, but it's true. When you're looking at a blank page of paper, the, the worst thing is to try and come up with what am I gonna write next? But what I usually do is I put out my little content calendar, I start filling in the gimmies, I start filling the things I know. The things I know are going to happen, they're gonna happen at the same time every single year. I fill those in, and then I can start filling in with other ideas, things that are coming out. So use your editorial calendar. Lather, rinse, repeat. Let's see, so we've gone through purpose, Efficiency and promotability. Make sure you've got all your promotional gizmos light up, lined up. You want to make sure that you can share your quotes, put them into a visual. I am not a photographer. I am the last person you want taking pictures. I am a word girl. So what I will do is I'll take a quote and put it into a visual. There's a million things out there now that you can do for that. Canva is one of them. I swear by it. It's so great for those of us who are design challenged. Not, not anybody in this room because you guys could whip up something <laughs> beautiful. Uh, make sure that you've got the right social media lead-ins. Try not to do the same thing on each, you know, on each social media platform because there's different audiences everywhere. And another thing I love to do, which adds some visual appeal and is also nice and efficient and useful, is click to tweet. I love click to tweet. I think that anytime someone's already in your blog and it's easy for them to tweet something of yours, that is a huge win. So everything comes from your blog and goes you're building this bank of content. Okay. Promotability means using your basic SEO. How many people in here are SEO experts? Oh, good, we got a couple. You can talk to them afterwards about really optimizing your SEO. But for those of us, the us mere mortals who are just trying to get by, just make sure you've got good keywords, get your tags in order, Make sure you've got decent categories. Try to line up four or five categories that are based on what you actually do. 
Sometimes what happens is we end up with like 10, 15 categories, like it's out of hand. Try, try starting with four or five and let everything flow into that. Um, you want to make sure that you have, I mean, it used to be more the meta and title tags. They've changed that now, as I understand it, going more to the rich snippets. If you have Yoast, you can very easily edit your rich snippet, and it's just making sure that it's got a description that has your keyword in it and excites people. And you can tweak it. That's the great thing about Yoast. The final P is personality. The best practices are to know your audience, know your goals, know what you're trying to do with your blog. Tell stories, be real, but not too real. Um, well, be real, but again, the blog is not Dear Diary. Um, and timing is everything. Just be aware of when you're putting something out there, what kind of outside event you're, you're trying to latch on to. The other piece of your personality is who your readers are. This is part of knowing your audience. You want to develop your reader personas. And the way you do that is find out what they want. Who are they following? What are they excited about? You know, what activities do they do? What are their goals? What is their role in the decision making? These are all the things you want to keep in mind as you're writing. And you can be writing a blog in the same subject for all of these different reader personas. And that's when you can segment, actually start to segment your marketing, which is great. We talked a little bit about the different content you can share. How many people here are not so much word people, they're more image people? So this is where you get your podcasts. This is where you get your video blogs in. Um, this is where you use your visuals. Again, Canva, love it. You guys probably already use way better stuff already. Um, Pixlr, you can use these too. These are the tools that you can use if you're not quite familiar with, um, with the visual part of blogging. Visuals add personality. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we like the quotes. The big thing for me with images is don't steal. Please credit. Like, there are so many photographers out there, and they're working, and they need to feed their kids just like we all do. So I always say partner with a local photographer. You know, someone who's building, maybe someone's building their portfolio. You can get them in at a rate that you might not normally be able to afford, or maybe you can barter with them. There's so many possibilities. But you can use your quotes in a visual way as well. And if you are in an industry that has access to stock, use them as well. That's a one to three RF2 is great for stock, but you guys probably already know if you're mostly designers. These are the plugins I use because I'm a simple girl. Jetpack, public size, integrates everything. MailChimp will allow you to create an automatic newsletter every week. It just goes right out to your people. That way you don't have to write a whole other newsletter. Integrates really easily with WordPress. I've heard that Constant Contact does as well, but I've mostly gone with MailChimp because not only am I a simple girl, I'm also a cheap girl. Not in that way. But um, <laughs> I like things to be cheap, and so um, I like MailChimp because it's free. Um, Yoast is also, I'm sure most of you are using Yoast, or the SEO guys have probably got their own great stuff that they're using. And that's all. Go forward and blog like a boss in your own lives. Of course. Mm. Of course, because everything's been so smooth. We have time for questions. Does anyone have any more questions? Yeah, in terms of long form, um, I work a lot with, uh, with organizations that are into complex issues, solving complex issues, nonprofits, and NGOs, and, mm -hmm. and there, um, and there, are, there are emerging platforms like Medium, mm -hmm. in which they, they publish to a sort of a great, hoping to reach a greater audience. Yeah. Now, what what do you think would be the best? How, how do you decide what should go on to something like Medium, mm -hmm. or put it on your personal blog? Now, you mentioned um, in the case of the medical people in the Down they, directly. They, they, they were interested in building some SEO. On their own blog, to, yeah. To drag the people, to, not drag, to attract people to their yeah. own It's okay. It's, it's medical. It's drag. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I have, you know, have you any experience with that, making decisions like that, as, as the long form gains a little more traction among certain areas? I think that with 
you know, there was, I, I, I attended a <coughs> seminar um, by Neil Patel, and he talked about, you know, when you're first putting your blog out, most of the stuff is going to be off your blog. So there's sort of two schools of thought. Now, my feeling is you want everything to emanate from your, your blog because you want to build a bank of content that you control. Mm -hmm. So what I end up doing is kind of a hybrid, and I, like, depending on the customer and what they're looking for, and in your case, I would say that there are definitely some things that lend themselves more to medium, and I would say, because I've published on medium as well, I tend to save medium more for the stuff where I know what the audience is going to be, and it's maybe a little outside my typical audience. Like, it's not a typical B2B audience. That's more of my sort of consumer-related content, like my funny stuff, you know, like that's what's going on there. Um, I'm not sure about medium for uh, nonprofits. But I think it would be something where you'd have to sort of experiment with it. And a lot of this still is so much experimentation. Well, I, I guess from my thinking, it's, it's when we're dealing with issues that are either controversial yeah. or uh, there's been, you know, uh, or there's some... Like mis ripped mis from the headlines. Right. The news or there's some headlines. misperceptions or someone's yeah. challenging accepted wisdom. Yeah. Right. Well, I think what I would do is I would create sort of one article that's ready for medium and directly for medium. And then maybe one that maybe goes a little bit more in depth or is a little bit more technical, and then sort of link. Yeah. And then you get the readership on Medium, but then maybe you'll drive some back to the website. And right. you can put right. more of an excerpted blog that's, that's, that's a good idea. on Medium and kind of keep it a little bit more short and sweet. I don't. I haven't tested them too much on like how they are with long, long, you know, pieces. Um, but my impression of them because they've got like okay, this is a this many minute read is that they lend themselves a little bit more to the short form, maybe three, five, maybe 900 words. Mm -hmm. um, and I found with the stuff I put on there, they, they do get good readership. Yeah. So it's definitely worth getting out there, especially if you have something that has legs, like something that's controversial, exciting in the news, you know, and then you can always jump people back if you want to read more, or read, read more in depth, you know, take a gander of what we've got going on over here at our blog. So mm -hmm. once you have an idea, mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on how to get from that idea to actually being published very efficiently? To being published, like published on the blog. On the so blog. For publishing your own blog. Exactly. Okay. Um, well, what I first of all I write everything in I don't write directly into the blog because that's scary to me. I like to be able to say things. Um, and what I typically do is just sort of word vomit a bunch of things. And um, and what happens is, what, what slows you down usually is your brain. So if you can just write a bunch of things and like put them all out there, then like go away, get a snack or a cup of tea and come back for coffee and then look at it again, you'll start to see how you can tweak it and fix it to make it better. Does that make sense? Because what happens is we, our brain gets in the way and then we go, okay, so this is a unique opportunity. No, I don't like unique. Uh, special, no, not special, right? you, you, you go through it. So the quickest way to do it is just to get everything down and try not to suck at it, and then go back and fix it. The more you can get good at revising, the quicker your process will be, I think. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that uh, competition has a very good post, and you know that the readers will be very happy with that post. Mm -hmm.
And whether you link to them or not, I think depends on you, your customers, and your competition. I mean, if they're true competition who would like stab you in the street, <laughs> but you know, some competition is, is more collaborative. I mean, we have relationships with businesses. I have a relationship with another copywriter. She does work for me. I do work for her. One hand washes the other. I link to her stuff. Because sometimes it's, she's going to be a fit, and sometimes I'm going to be a fit. Right. It's okay. It's not. It's not a zero sum game. Yes. And the other thing is that you know, it's like you have it on your list. You know, it could be settling and arguing, right? You may think that that person is wrong about a few points. You could say, Joe said this. Yeah. Here's Here's Joe is wrong. And let me tell you why. Yeah. 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 Nicer than that, though. Especially because <laughs> 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 you don't want to incite them to stab you in the street. You, you want it to be kind of like, you know, recently one of our competitors published this article. While we think it's got a lot of great points, here's, you know. Yeah. Well, you, now, can always, you can always say, like, many observers feel that. Yeah, you, you can go a little bit more. Like Industry sources said. <laughs> sources close to the president. Uh, right. <laughs> the old testing, so. but that, I mean, those are ways you can get around this. That's a lot of ways. Anyone else? I'd like to, I'd like to put a lot of paragraph headers, clickable links in, because mm -hmm. there's nothing worse than searching for something. You have to go to control left to try to find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That helps you with more time on the pages. Like clickable links to other um, sections or paragraph headers in bold. I think paragraph headers are good. I think sections depends on how long your article is. Words. Yeah, I mean in that case, yeah, you definitely want some you, you want a little bit you want it to be easy for people to get around in it. So yeah, in that case I think it makes sense. Yeah. But you don't want to you don't want to muck it up. Like you don't want so many that people get like, you know, there's so many links that I can't get back to where I want it to go. You know, you don't want to distract people too much. You know, you want to keep them there. So it's it's always it's always a judgment call. It's not you know, in so much of what we do, it's not it's it's an art and a science. So a lot of it is going to be what your instinct kind of tells you, you know, along with what we've talked about here. Yeah. I still have you know what I use with my kids in school, <laughs> paragraph construction. Yes. An assertion <laughs> and support, 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 and then a summary. Yep. Any of us who learn the grammar from the nuns, we are going to be using that for the rest of our lives. Last <laughs> question. Mm -hmm. oh. Hey. Um, one, um, how do you feel about guest speakers coming, you know, promoting to get guest speakers into your blog? And the second one, what about um, LinkedIn and putting articles there? I like LinkedIn because you you are going to get more readership. The only trouble is, again, I am always about like. What was similar back on my on my original you know on my blog on my original content? So I, I don't there's not a lot that I put out there that isn't some version of what I have already written. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That was a really weird sentence. But you know if I'm going to put something on LinkedIn, chances are I'm either going to link back to it on my blog later on, or it's a version of something I had already created. Not duplicate content because that's bad, but something that they can get either way depending on on how they get to me. And I think like. You know, getting guest speakers and getting guest bloggers on your blog, it's just a good thing. It's just, it takes the weight off you. So. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you.